Hey Rob, can you uh, take a few minutes and talk about that light engine enclosure that you worked on? Of course. Um, you know what I'm really curious to know is what kind of challenges did we face with that project when the customer first came to us? Well, originally it was two pieces. Um, they used a different process called pixel molding. So this whole assembly right here, this front half was a single piece that bolted on to another piece right here. Um, had a couple different screws up front. Um, so not only did you have a two piece assembly, which is more expensive, um, but you also had the assembly dimensional component to it. So when I attach this on there, it can be attached slightly differently and how this piece relates back to this piece could give them issues um, when they're assembling their final product down the line. So what we decided to do was to simplify everything by making the two-piece assembly one die-cast piece so that we lose this relationship um, when you have the assembly process. And then you also save money on components, you save money on shipping just because you have you know less to send separately, they save time. Um, it was a win-win for both companies, really. Cool. You know, I, I want to talk a little bit about the design phase process and a little bit about your approach to designing something, whether it be this project or another one, but more specifically to this. Um, so what was the customer's criteria for this project right from the beginning? Well, the customer's criteria is that they needed an end product that'll work, that'll function for them. Uh, cosmetically, everything had to be there, but you know, it doesn't have to be a piece of jewelry. So that makes it a great candidate for, you know, a more ambitious gating situation where you may have, you know, some issues in, you know, like rib areas with non-fills and stuff like that. But as long as the customer knows about it and it's not anything that's you know, a mating surface or something that's used for their final assembly. It, it's it's just going to save them money. So it's more about talking to the customer and kind of describing, okay, here's the ways to save money, here's what could happen, but we don't see it as being an issue for you. Do you agree? And then, you know, if they agree, then everybody moves forward with it. So we had to do quite a few things. I mean, from two pieces to one piece, there were a lot of structural ribs that were in there that we found out that weren't really structural. There was really no need to have them there. It was, um, And there were a couple other features that we ended up just pulling out because they didn't need them. So it kind of helps to take even a part like this that was in production and two pieces before to take a fresh look at the design and really look at, okay, do I actually need this in the in the final model? So what type of steps did you take to come up with this type of a model? Well, first off, we had a meeting with both the internal CWM team and their team as well. So when they came here, they had the, you know, the idea that they were going to help us redesign this part for them. So that being said, they come here, we take a look and we open up their assembly and say, okay, what are the pieces that all fit in here? What are your important mating surfaces? And then from there you can determine what can I get rid of? So some stuff obviously has to be in there. Like, you know, you need some structural ribs. It's a pretty open piece. You want to keep it from flexing and bending. So there were some things that we had to leave in there, but most of those things could be redesigned from what was originally in there just to make it easier to manufacture and then less expensive for the customer down the line. Mm -hmm. when, when you were looking at uh, coming up with this t type of design, did you reject anything that uh, initially might have been kicked out? I mean, thrown in as a possibility? Um, I think on this one, no. Just because once we kind of explain how to design a part for die casting, the customer starts to really understand, you know, what we're looking for. It's, it's really pretty simple rules. I mean, you need draft, everything needs to be pulled in the correct direction, and then you need radii. I mean, once you have that, you have the basic building blocks of, you know, how do I puzzle piece this out so that I can, I can cast whatever feature they want to in there. So, you know, after we kind of explained what we were looking for, what we needed for a casting process, they could go back to their design and say, okay, how can we modify this to to make it easier? And in the end, that's that's kind of how it works. So 
there weren't really a lot of pieces that that they wanted to try and add because they already had too much in there is what we found out. So there was more of the pulling out rather than putting in. Great, great. So once you have the design done, are, are there challenges to actually manufacturing something like this, the size? Sure. Or the I mean, it's, it's a large magnesium part. It runs in our largest magnesium machine. Um, you know, it's a big part, so your shot rate is gonna be much slower than say, you know, a part the size of your fist or even smaller. Um, so you have to make sure that each one of those shots count. Um, you know, you, if, you have a, if you have three pieces that are bad on this part compared to, you know, a part that's, you know, the size of my thumb, then you've got a much worse situation on a part this size. I mean, you have to recycle more, you have to do more things to a larger mold. So you want to be careful on a part this size that you do as much up front as you possibly can. Okay. So in the end, how is the customer going to benefit from this design? Well, it can all be machined in one process. So before they would have to machine this piece, they would have to machine this piece, and then they'd have to assemble everything. There's a lot of human contact that goes into that. Um, there's a lot of transfer of setup faces in the CNC machine. So what we did is we moved to a one piece design. So everything that happens on this face always relates back to the rest of the part. And then we've also figured out a way that we only have to fixture this three different times into the CNC machine, where before you would have a multiple, multiple station fixture, you know, um, on two different parts. So we just fixture it once here, once here, and then it goes on to this face, and then we have an indexing fixture that rotates around on five different orientations to machine the rest of it up. So that way there's not as much human error when you're clamping on the part, you know, because when we clamp you can sometimes see that you can get flex, so you have to put in work supports that are going to be adequate so that when you machine it doesn't bend the part or, you know, it's actually cutting material rather than pushing the part away from the cutter. So. Great. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, Rob.